The Gotha G-1 was a rather peculiar-looking airplane. Designed right after the start of the First World War, it was made to be a jack-of-all-trades while operating as a gunship of sorts. The combination of these misplaced roles and its dead-end design made it doomed from the start. However, it ended up kickstarting the infamous Gotha line of bombers that would eventually make up the first London Blitz in 1917. This is a brief history of the Gotha Ursinus G-1 Kampfflugzeug. <laughs> Before I begin, if you like aviation history such as this, consider subscribing to get notified when I upload future videos. Feel free to leave a like or a comment to help the video reach more people and encourage me to make more. Now, on to our regularly scheduled program. The origins of why this airplane was created in the first place has its start in early 1914. At this time, there was much discussion between the Verkehrstechnische Prüfungskommission (VPK), Inspection der Fliegertruppen (Eidflieg), and various aviation industry leaders regarding what would be the most effective role for military aircraft. Their conclusion was then sent to the German Central Army Office, which approved of the new designations on April 28, 1914, two months to the day before Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo. This directive effectively split new German military aircraft into three categories, or types. The first, Type 1, was defined as a fast two-seater, powered by a 130 horsepower engine and used for extended bombing or reconnaissance missions. Type 2 was defined as a lighter, very maneuverable armed two-seater intended for short flights near the enemy. Type 3, and the most important for this video, was defined as a three-man biplane for long flights carrying a load of 450 kilograms low over the enemy. Its minimum max speed was required to be 120 kilometers an hour, 74 miles per hour, while having an endurance of six hours, all powered by an engine, or engines, totaling to 200 horsepower. It would need to be able to fit onto military train cars for long distance transit and have the ability to be assembled for flight in one and a half hours or less. Oscar Ursinus, a civil engineer by trade and the founder of the extremely influential Flugsport magazine, took great interest in this directive. Although he lacked the resources to do much with his interest outside of promoting heavier-than-air machines through his journal, this changed when the war broke out. Mobilized on August 1st to report to the Flieger Erstes Abteilung 3 (FEA3) in Darmstadt, he immediately saw an opportunity. Putting together a plan of action, he approached Major Friedel, the commander of the unit, with the idea of utilizing the idle men of the FEA3 to build a Kampfflugzeug based on previous sketches and ideas he had before the war for a civil float plane. Friedel agreed, so long as his name could be attached to the end result. Thus began the life of the Friedel Ursinus Kampfflugzeug. Ursinus, with the assistance of experienced pilots Erlevin and August Nischwitz, had the plans completed enough to begin construction on September 1st. Eventually, Eidflieg found out about the project and approved of it, giving the new aircraft the official designation of B1092-14. Completed sometime in January, the FU Kampfflugzeug had a very unconventional design. Ursinus would write in an article for Flugsport that the purpose of the raised fuselage was to create new benefits while avoiding various issues of a traditionally designed biplane. According to him, the raised fuselage eliminated the slipstream turbulence on the upper wing. It also allowed for the propellers and engines to be placed extremely close together so that in the case of an engine failing, the asymmetrical forces would be greatly reduced, giving the aircraft better stability and a higher level of control as a pilot brought it into land in or near friendly territory. He also pointed out the benefits of stability of the concentration of weight offered to the aircraft thanks to the engines being so close to the center line. The engines, along with the bottom of the crewed positions, was covered in chrome nickel armor plating to offer protection from ground fire. This, combined with the nose gunner's ability to shoot straight down, gave the aircraft a theoretical excellent ground attack ability, fitting the role of a gunship. Fitted with 100 horsepower Mercedes D1 engines, the first test flight would be conducted on January 30th, 1915. Many contemporary sources claim this was the first twin-engine German airplane to take flight, but research by Peter Gross shows that AEG was documenting test flights for their own twin-engine Kampfflugzeug, the AEG K1, a couple of weeks earlier. Regardless of this minor error correction, the test flights went well, and Ursinus invited Eidflieg to evaluate the now operational aircraft. One Dr. Heller was sent with an entourage to look over the odd FU airplane, and they arrived in Darmstadt on February 20th. His report gives us an excellent overview of the Ursinus Kampfflugzeug, with an airspeed of 90 to 95 kilometers an hour, 55 to 60 miles per hour, the aircraft was controlled by stick, with dual rudders in the tail and the aileron situated on the upper wing only. The fuel was held in two separate gravity tanks, giving the aircraft an endurance of six hours. 
The advantages noted were the excellent field of fire for the nose gunner and the apparent ability for the aircraft to fly smoothly on one engine, thanks to the placement of the propellers. The disadvantages Heller noted, however, were numerous. He noted the fuselage placement posed an undue threat to the pilot and gunners in the event of a crash, that the structure of the fuselage was weak, that the ailerons were far too small, that stick control proved insufficient for the size of the airplane, that both engines being right turned caused an unnecessary pull to the right, that more powerful engines would be required to achieve the required speeds, and lastly, that the armor was useless. Hella still found that the design had much potential and recommended its acceptance to Eadfleeg as a purely fighting aircraft, although it would require a top-of-the-line pilot to effectively fly it. He also recommended it be further developed by an actual manufacturer before serial production. Shortly after, the B-1092 was sent to an airfield near Lodz on the Eastern Front, becoming the first confirmed twin-engine aircraft to reach the front lines, beating the AEG Grossflugzeug 2 by four months, although whether it flew a single combat mission is completely unknown and highly speculative. Shortly after, Ursinus began courting Fokker and Goto Wagenfabrik as potential manufacturers of the Friedel Ursinus Kampflugzeug. Both initially declined. Fokker, for their part, was busy working on their own Kampflugzeug, the failed prototype Fokker K-1. Goto seemed less firm in their rejection, and Ursinus tried again shortly after the FEA-3 was transferred to the town of Gotha itself, eventually convincing director Albert Kant to sign a production license in March of 1915. On April 1st, Eadfleek officially created a contract with Gotha to produce six Gotha Ursinus Kampflugzeug, GUK. Five of these would be powered by the 150 horsepower Benz BZ3 engines, with the six being powered by two 160 horsepower Mercedes D3 engines. The war had also changed the requirements of the Kampflugzeug itself. With the static nature of war, only a crew of two was required, the nose gunner and the pilot. An extra observer was deemed superfluous. It was also required to reach a maximum speed of 125 kilometers an hour, 77 miles per hour, and carry a 200 kilogram bomb load, 440 pounds, while also having a minimum of 150 kilograms of armor protection, 330 pounds. This last requirement would eventually be knocked down and not used. One go-to engineer, Hans Burkhardt, ironically the most critical of the Ursinus airplane, was put in the position to work on modifying the design with Oscar. Small changes were made to the overall design, the new engines were fitted, and the first Gotha Ursinus Kampflugzeug rolled out of the factory on July 27, 1915. It sat at 12 meters long and 3.9 meters high. The upper wing stretched out to 20.3 meters, while the lower wing reached 19.3. With the two 150 horsepower Benz BZ3 engines, it had an empty weight of 1,800 kilograms and a maximum takeoff weight of 2,966 kilograms, being able to reach a maximum speed of 130 kilometers an hour, 80 miles per hour. Based on my calculations, which you can find in the pinned comment below, the Gotha Ursinus Kampflugzeug had a useful load of 848 kilograms. Of these initial six made, three were sent to FEA-7 in order to defend the Krupp works from the increasing threat of an Entente air raid. Two others were attached to the FEA-3, while the last was sent to Army Abteilung Falkenhausen. These aircraft cost 32,000 marks each, or 206,000 US dollars today, adjusted for inflation. This cost, unfortunately, does not include the price of the engines. To top off that bad news, I was unable to find a reliable source for the cost of a Benz BZ-3. Two more series of the Gotha Ursinus battle plane would be ordered, the first of these on July 15, 1915, for six more using the Benz BZ-3 engines, and the last production series ordered on October 17, 1915, for yet another six. This last order would have the GUK-1, now labeled as the Gotha Grossflugzeug 1, fitted with the slightly more powerful 160 horsepower Mercedes D3 engines although the details of how performance was improved is lacking. This last series also saw the return of the second gunner position for defensive armament, as well as an increase in the aircraft's bomb load requirements as the dreams of a Kampflugzeug gunship faded and the necessity of a heavy bomber emerged. Interestingly, Eadfleek also requested Gotha to experiment with the possibility of adding a machine cannon onto the nose position. In this photo, we can clearly see Oscar Ursinus testing such a gun, the 2cm, 20mm, Becker cannon in the nose position. Once in the field, issues of the aircraft noted by Hella months earlier became blatantly apparent. Landing was made difficult by the position of the pilot seat, leading to two of the aircraft to not only crash during a routine flight, but to flip over, in one case killing both pilot and observer. The first of these accidents was recovered by Hans Burkhardt, studied, and rebuilt into a test bed that would lay the foundation for the Gotha Grossflugzeug 2. One of these crashes was made worse by the fuselage connection points failing, 
the plane had been made in order to be disassembled and placed onto train cars. This failure potentially exasperated the cause of the bad landing, if not causing it altogether, and eventually flip. But that is merely speculation by yours truly. Manfred von Richthofen offers us our only first-hand account of the Gotha Ursinus Kampfflugzeug 1's fighting ability, writing that the speed of the airplane was too slow to catch up to enemy fighters and that the propellers posed a rather omnipresent threat to the nose gunner when trying to drop bombs. He nearly lost a finger at one point trying to signal to his friend piloting the aircraft. This photo possibly shows his friend, Jörg Zoimer, sitting in the pilot seat of a Gotha Ursinus G1. A tube of sorts was eventually added to allow the observer gunner to drop bombs through the floor of the aircraft safely, with no risk to himself or the aircraft. Other models were fitted with a large bomb container, while others had bombs mounted under the wing, while still others had a combination of all three. There was still another variant, however, the Gotha UWD. Remember earlier when I mentioned the original intention for the design was as a civil transport float plane? Well, so did Ursinus. In April of 1915, he proposed a seaplane version of the GUK-1 to Eadfleet, who placed an order for such a machine shortly after. This airplane would take longer to properly design, build, and test, being officially delivered to Seeflugzeug Versuch's Commando on December 30, 1915. During test flights, men were used as the ballast, causing the naval acceptance engineer to be extremely surprised seeing man after man deboard the airplane after the tests. He exclaimed, calling it a Trojan horse a nickname that stuck. Slightly longer and taller than its land-based counterparts, the Gotha UWD was powered by two 160 horsepower Mercedes D3 engines, giving it a top speed of 137 kilometers an hour, 85 miles per hour. This also gives us a good baseline for the performance of the later made Gotha G1s. The controls were also improved, reportedly being easy to fly and land. It took part in the semi-successful bombing raid of Dover in 1916, dropping some 35 5 kilogram bombs and being the only aircraft of the flight to avoid being intercepted. Unfortunately, the weak airframe pointed out by Dr. Heller was not fixed, and a hard landing saw the UWD damaged beyond repair, being officially written off on December 2, 1916. Only one Gotha G1 is known to have possibly survived the war, G13-15, flown by Leutnant Le. It had been stationed almost entirely on the Eastern Front in the Baltic, and it would be scrapped at some point, although the exact date isn't exactly known. No known parts of any G1 are known to still exist either. It is very likely some aircraft survived the war, but any information on that would be within the post-war Inter-Allied Armistice Commission, which I can't seem to find anywhere. If anyone knows where such a report can be found, please let me know. On another note, Jörg Paul Neumann may have written of the Gotha Ursinus bomber briefly, mentioning the G1 aircraft in 1915, although this could have just as easily been the AEG Grossflugzeug 2. Regardless, the only thing he mentions regarding their performance is their spectacular performance as an observation aircraft. If you made it this far, thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Recently, my channel hit 5,000 subscribers, and I couldn't be more grateful. Let me know what aircraft you want to see covered next. Until then, blue skies and tailwinds.